come to put the prophet in his tum tum. One day when he's running his son, he'll get spit out and go. Good morning. Again, my name is Keith. And if you're wondering what that little ditty was that you just heard a little bit on that intro, it is called a shanty. Does anybody know what a shanty is? Good. Some of you do. So Alex Young and I, Alex usually is up here singing with us, um, uh, we decided to make our own little shanty for Jonah because it's a sea story, right? At least part of it is. So uh, we want to let you know that uh, you can go to your YouTube channel and check that full song out. Uh, we're pretty excited about it uh, because we're nerds. So that's just how that, that's just how that happens. But, um, in all seriousness, I am so excited today in general uh, for a number of reasons. I got to play drums, uh, which excites me because I love drums. I got to wear my favorite shirt. You see what it says? Repent and believe the good news, right? It's super awkward in public sometimes, which is great. Um, and I get to preach from the book of Jonah, which really is a fantastic book. But it's one that we often sort of mix up in terms of like, what is it actually saying? What's the point of the book of Jonah? We tend to sort of focus in on uh, Jonah's character flaws, and in that we can sort of miss the overarching theme of the book. And the theme of the book really is salvation belongs to the Lord, right? From start to finish, salvation is a work of the Lord. It's God who has woven that together. It's His plan, right? We would never come up with that. And it's meant to show us God's sovereignty in salvation. This morning, where we're going to start is God's sovereignty and, and salvation belonging to Him in that He's the one that gets to send that message out, right? He's the one who decides, like, here's how we're going to do this. And so we run into Jonah and sort of his hesitancy to proclaim the message of salvation that belongs to the Lord. That's where we start this morning. As I was growing up, uh, there was a phrase that my mom would often say to me. She would say, don't tell the Lord what you're not going to do. You heard something like that? That's really good advice. It's really good advice. And the implication with that is she was like, every time I say to God, no, I'm not going to do this, that's exactly what God calls me to do, right? That's exactly what God puts right in front of us. This is what I want you to do. And that's where we meet Jonah this morning. God has called him to do something very specific. And Jonah just is outright like, no, I'm not going to do that. But as we look at his calling and his running from his call, we're going to learn some things about salvation and how God has told his people, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go proclaim the message of mercy. And no amount of us kicking and screaming and, and trying to rear against that is going to stop the Lord from sending out his message of salvation. So this morning, we're going to jump right into it. The first thing that we see in terms of God's sovereignty and God's salvation is this. God will deal with the evil of all people. You might be like, well, this is a little bit of a weird place to start. Why are we starting in this place? Because right? it feels uncomfortable for us to ascribe actual evil to people, especially in our current cultural climate. Right now, the most evil thing is to imply that somebody else's acts, thoughts, or choices are evil. Right? So one of the most evil, evil things we can do in our culture now is point at something else and say, well, that's immoral. Right? That's evil. Because then somebody looks at you and you're like, no, you're evil. Because you told somebody they can't do that, or they can't think that, or they can't feel that. That's our sort of cultural climate right now. But I want you to read verse 1 with me. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Right? God is now ready to deal with the evil of the Assyrians, the evil of the Ninevites. So Jonah is commissioned by God. Jonah is a prophet of God. Jonah is commissioned by God to go and declare, though, not to his own people, but to the Assyrians, to the Ninevites, that God's patience with their wickedness is over and they will be judged and destroyed. Their evil has come up before me. So there's a couple problems in this as we read this text. The great thing about Scripture is if we read it carefully enough, we can always find sort of some theological conundrums, right? Some things that sort of 
cause us to tilt our head a little bit and wonder, well, what does this mean? So when God says their evil has come up before me, does that mean he wasn't paying attention before? Does that mean he wasn't aware of evil? So God just sort of hangs out, and then once things get bad enough, he's like, whoa, I didn't even realize this was going on. Now, it might feel like that sometimes, right? You look around, and you're like, does God even understand? Does God even understand, know what's going on? Is God actively seeing what people are doing, what people are saying, the horrendous things that are happening in our world? Well, this phrase, their evil has come up before me, simply put, while there is always evil happening, God has great patience with sinful humanity. I mean, look all through Scripture. Great patience. Even if you look at the, the tale of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, there's a begging. Like, hey, if you can find this many people, will you save it? Sure. If you can find one person, will, will you stop? Sure. Right? But it, there's a time when evil just rises up to the level of God's great justice, right, provoked provoked in a way that his patience then is overshadowed, right? I.e. the flood, Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, etc. It's not that God doesn't realize evil is happening. It's just that his grace and his mercy abides until there reaches a point where things are so, so bad that his justice has to go forth, okay? But what happens next is even more uncomfortable for those of us who are God's people. It makes sense to us that the evil of Nineveh would come up before the Lord because they're evil, right? They don't worship God. Uh, they worship foreign gods. They worship those that are not gods. They're pagans. They're outside of the people of God. So it would make sense to us that their evil would come up. But, but what about Jonah? This is a prophet of God. So God calls him and says, hey, I want you to go declare uh, they're evil, right? That great city, call out against the city. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So instead of accepting his commission, Jonah's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And he takes off, right? Finds a boat as far away as he can get from going to Nineveh. Jonah, the prophet of the Lord, had his own evil to deal with, right? God will deal with the evil of all people. Now, we always tend to think of, even as God's people, we tend to think of everybody else as evil, but we're not. We have no evil, right? Now, while it's true that Christ has paid our penalty, right, we still act sinfully. Do we, you agree with that? You agree with me? Yeah, we have our own evil. Jonah, the prophet of the Lord, had his own evil to deal with. Instead of obeying God's commission, Jonah decided to bail. Two times in the opening verses, we see that Jonah's goal was to get away from the presence of the Lord. He's like, away from the presence of the Lord. You see that twice there, right? Jonah rose to flee from the presence of the Lord. And then again, later, away from the presence of the Lord. But again, it's just like the evil coming up before God, is it possible to actually get away from the presence of the Lord? What do you think? Is that possible? No. If you know anything about God, right, if you know anything about his character, who he is, it's impossible to actually get away from the presence of the Lord, but that's not what's meant here. Jonah knows that. He knows that he can't get away from God, but the idea be com being communicated is that Jonah was trying to get away from the task. He was trying to get away from his calling, and the farther, the better. We're going to see in chapter 4 that Jonah didn't want to be the one to deliver the news because he actually knew God's character. Because Jonah knew God's character, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Because he knew God's mercy, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. And so he wanted to get as far away from the calling as he possibly could. It's pretty messed up, wouldn't you agree? God calls him to go proclaim to the city that he's going to destroy it. Jonah thinks he's going to be able to run away from God's presence to get out of the task. It's pretty messed up. Now, maybe Jonah thought, I'm not really that important, and God's going to find somebody else to do this. Have you ever done that before? I'm sure you haven't. I have. <laughs> you know, God, I feel very strongly that I'm called to, to do something, and instead I'm like, you know what, I don't need to be the one to do this because God's got plenty of people, and he'll just take somebody else and use them, right? Right? Jonah may have thought that, like, he can send somebody else, but it ain't going to be me. But one of the looming questions of this book has to be for us, why 
is Jonah so opposed to this calling? Why? Does that seem, it seems a little bit extreme upon first reading, like in this first few verses, like Jonah's immediate reaction to go to Nineveh is like, no way. I'm going in the opposite direction. Like, find somebody else. It ain't going to be me. I'll prophesy to Israel all you want, but I'm not going there. But why? What's with this visceral reaction? Two pieces of information are going to help us, and this will help us understand what a great task this actually was. The first is knowing what God had already prophesied to disobedient Israel, both through Amos in the northern kingdom and through Isaiah in the southern kingdom. God had already made it clear to them, God had made clear to Israel and would continue to make it clear to them that Assyria would be coming for them, right? Because of their disobedience, their repeated turning from him and not doing what he asked them to do, he was going to judge his own people by foreign nations, right? So it was going to be Assyria. We see that in Scripture. And Jonah would have known this. The second piece of information is, well, then who, who were the Assyrians? In a word, evil. I mean, some of the stuff that they did, I can't even, I can't say with, with kids present here this morning, right? Or with an earshot. I mean, it's terrible. And if you want to look at uh, artistic depictions, they are out there because the Assyrians loved what they did so much, they actually made reliefs of these actions that they would do to their enemies. They would flay their enemies. If you don't know what that is, they'd stake them down to the ground and skin them with a sharp knife, alive. They'd burn uh, teenage boys and girls. They'd cut off arms, feet, hands, noses, ears. They'd stack the heads of their enemies as makeshift totem poles and make celebratory art displaying all these things. Now, I ask you, does this sound like a group of people that you would like to hang out with if you are one of their enemies? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. They also made the conquered people their servants in many cases. This was not going to be enjoyable for the people of God. This was not going to be fun. It was not going to be a walk in the park. These, these people were evil, right? They were warriors, and the warfare that they practiced was terrible. You know, Isaiah prophesied in, in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, the Assyrian, the rod to express my anger and the staff in my hand for my denunciation. And if you read that, then you go to Psalm 23 and you're like, oh, that rod and staff comforting me strikes a little bit different when we see that, right? And when we see Scripture talking about God's rod and staff, it's for the purpose of discipline, right? It, it's a comfort that God disciplines us. But in this case, the Assyrians were going to be his his tool of discipline for his own disobedient people. So knowing all this, knowing that Assyria was going to kind of have their way in a certain sense, now they, they ended up not being able to take Jerusalem, and that's a whole another great story. But, uh, but do you think that Jonah was justified in not wanting these people to be saved from destruction? Now, I'm not asking you theologically right now. I'm asking you viscerally, okay? You imagine the, the most heinous nation in the world right now that you could possibly think of, that if they got a hold of us, would do terrible things to us, okay? Like that, that their nation would be like, we're just going to raise this place to the ground. I want you to think, and, and we can maybe think of a few that would love to do bad things to, to our nation, right? Okay, now I want you to imagine that God in the quietness of your room, visits you and says, I want you to go over and stand right in the square of the biggest city in that place and start declaring that I'm going to, to destroy them. How do you think that would go for you? Would you be scared? I would be scared, right? We're very hard on Jonah, but if we're honest, that's a pretty tough call. I want you to go to this city. I want you to go to these people and declare that their time is up. Now, I don't think he was afraid because his actions in the boat don't really show him to be afraid. I just think he really didn't want that group of people to, to be aided at all by him declaring God's mercy to them. Call it what you will, but I don't know that I would feel differently if I were Jonah, right? Right? I don't know that I would. It's hard. Jonah did not want to be part of God's mission to offer mercy to the people who would devote God's people to destruction. 
This is what we might call an ethical crisis, right? Should Jonah obey the Lord and deliver God's message or reject the call in defense of his own people? Feels like he's between a rock and a hard place here, right? But, but, theologically, the reality is it is an evil thing to reject the command of the Lord, and it is an evil for which God will pursue and chasten his runaway prophet. Now, as we talk about salvation belonging to the Lord, the call of salvation belongs to the Lord. If God says, this is who I want you to go to and declare my mercy, to declare my goodness, to declare my existence, we don't get to be the ones to choose who gets that call and who doesn't. But Jonah wants to stand in that place. Jonah wants to be like, no, I'm not going to deliver the message of warning to them. I'm not going to be the one. And that was evil because it was in direct defiance to God's commands. And we can look at the the Ninevites, we can look at the Assyrians and say all those things they did were evil. But what Jonah was saying to God was evil too. Because Jonah knew God. Jonah was God's messenger, set apart to be God's messenger, and he refused his call. I identify, like my early 20s, this book and me are like this because I understand what that is to to have God be like, this is what I want you to do, and be like, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't end well. I mean, it ends well, but for a few years, it doesn't end well. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you've been in the same place. Jonah found a ship to Tarshish, which is in Spain, and probably as far as he thought he could get from Nineveh, and it wasn't a cheap trip either. It was a pricey one. And I tend to think the way that the the Scripture reads, the way way that the text reads, that Jonah just forked out a ton of money and thought, I'm just getting out of here, I'm not coming back. (laughs) He was just going to go. And the fact that Jonah repeats twice that he fled from the Lord's presence is an indication that he knows it's grievous sin too. He knows what he's doing, right? He realizes the error of his ways. This is not a small thing to reject the call of the Lord. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. Because the thing is, God is pretty tenacious with his people, right? When God wants something from his people, he's not just like, hey, can you do this for me? And we're like, no, thanks. He's like, all right, never mind, right? It's, that doesn't work like that. Uh, scripture actually says that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Once God places that call, right, once God calls out, that's, that's it. It's settled, right? That's, that's his call. He gets to make that call. So Jonah's like, no, I'm not going to do it. Look at verse 4. But the Lord, anytime you see that phrase in Scripture, you know something's coming, right? God doesn't just go, eh, whatever. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Tenacity and sovereignty are a pretty dangerous combo, right? God is tenacious, and he also has all the power So when you think, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do, you better buckle up. This is going to get rough, and it does for Jonah. There is no way that God is not going to address Jonah's evil, right? So the the evil of the Ninevites comes up before the Lord, and God wants to send Jonah to declare to them, hey, it's too far. So why would Jonah think that his evil in rejecting God's call is not going to come up before the Lord? It's, It's pretty silly. What God has called him to, God himself is going to see through. God is going to use his might and his tenacity to work in Jonah what Jonah was unwilling to accomplish. And now Jonah has brought innocent sailors into this great big mess, right? Think about that. This is a great place for us to to realize that your sin, right? And I'm talking, believer, listen, when we reject God's call, when, when God has placed a call on us and we choose not to do that, right? If we choose to walk away from obedience to God, a lot of times we think, well, this is not hurting anybody else. That is wrong. You will bring all sorts of people into your mess, We tend to think our sin is just about us. It's not just about you. You will bring your family in. You will bring your friends in. You will bring people that you don't even know in, in your disobedience to the sovereign call of God. And the reason that God does that is because, believer, he loves you. God is not exacting some sort of petty revenge on Jonah. God loves Jonah. Read the whole book through. You'll see that. God wants to work in Jonah, what Jonah is unwilling to submit to. And God is relentless in that. But remember, 
Like, when we choose to walk away from God, when Jonah chooses to walk away from God's call, he's bringing all sorts of people into it that had no place in it in the first place. All these sailors on this boat, right? But are they, are they really innocent, though? Are they, are they really innocent? This might approach it with a, without a good theological context is to say that these guys were innocent. How do we know that they're not completely innocent? Well, look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to what? To his God. Okay, so maybe they're not completely innocent. What we see here is they're, they're pluralistic at best, right, or they're syncretistic. They, they all have their own gods. They're from different places. They worship different gods. So as soon as God hurls this storm to get Jonah's attention, these guys are wrapped up into it. But instead of, like, crying out to the one true God, obviously they're crying out to their own personal gods. And then we see their evil. Their evil is in rejecting the one true God, right? They're responsible for their own sin as well. So they're not fully innocent, but we would also say maybe they shouldn't have to pay for Jonah's stupidity. But we see here, right, what do they do? What's their first reaction? Stuff goes down, and they start crying out to their own gods, which shows us this. In a crisis, everybody shows where their hope is placed, right? In a sticky spot, everybody shows where their hope is. These sailors were worshipers of various gods. While they're panicking and trying to find every way to stay afloat, Jonah was in the bottom of the ship doing what? Sleeping. And you might say, well, maybe he had a WWJD bracelet on. Because Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? That's out of line. It's it's not, not in the right place chronologically, but Jonah's sleeping in the middle of a storm, while all these pagan sailors are like shouting out and crying out to their gods, probably terrified. So the captain has to go down into the bottom of the ship. He's having none of this. And he's like, dude, what are you doing? Wake up. Like, why are you sleeping? How can you sleep while this is going on? What are you doing sleeping? And then he says, get up and call out to whatever God you serve. You got a God? Get up, call out to him. Because maybe he's the one, right? And do you, see, do you see how crazy this is? Nobody's got any sort of like certainty about anything. They're all like, well, maybe it's my God. Maybe it's your God. You cry out to your God. Let, let, wake this guy up. Let's have him cry out to his God because we don't know which God is in control of this stuff. What a way to live. But isn't that sort of indicative of even the cultural moment that we live in? Like it's like these guys are like they're hedging their bets, the idea is like any port in a storm, or in this case, it's like any God in a storm. Like, what's going to help us? This, 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 this. What's going to help me right now? What theory that's popular right now is going to help me? Right? What religion right now that's popular is going to help me? What practice is going to help me? I'll just bring that into to my religious views. I'll just bring that into my spirituality. What is it that's going to get me through this? Right? How true that is of so many people throughout time, and especially right now. Hedge your bets religiously, right? Call on whatever God, whatever spirituality, whatever practice will give you peace and calm your storm. It doesn't matter what you call on as long as you're sincere, right? Did that work for these guys? No. Because the object of your faith really does matter. And so they're waking Jonah up. They're like, why why are you sleeping? But how many of us, this is where I see myself in Jonah, right? If you dig deep into this, Jonah's in the bottom of the boat sleeping. He's running from God and his call. He's surrounded by a bunch of pagans who don't know the one true God. He's asleep in the bottom of the boat while certain destruction is swirling around, and the pagan has to come to the true God worshiper and say, you need to wake up and call on your God. But how many of us are just like Jonah? Caught sleeping, while the pagans around us are frantically trying to save themselves. While those who don't know the one true God are the ones who are more concerned about what's happening around us. Running from the commission to proclaim God's mercy and unconcerned with declaring to everyone the one true God of salvation. What a sad beginning to this story. The only person on the ship who knows God is the least interested in calling out to him. 
the one person on the ship. And this also shows that when you, when you run from God's calling, J- Jonah had just rejected God's call, so not only was he not going to go to Nineveh, now he's in the midst of a bunch of pagans who are in a lot of trouble, and Jonah's not even concerned with them knowing about the one true God. And do you see how, believer, our sin and our evil of rejecting God's commission or God's call, it even makes us dull to the fact that we are the ones who know the one true God. Jonah's the only one in that boat who has any hope to give, and he's the least interested in giving it. And unfortunately, I feel like that's largely a picture of how the church is functioning in this moment in culture. And we're the only ones who really have hope. And in many circumstances, we seem the least interested in offering it to a world that's panicking. What a sad beginning to this story. And this is evil. If we can't see the evil in, in this, then we're just, we're blinded. It's perhaps more evil than even the pagan sailor's desperation. And if Jonah is not going to declare him willingly, God is going to expose him in front of these people. God's like, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Looks like the hard way. We've been conditioned to think of our calling as something more about our individualism, our design, our platform, our preferences, but our calling is more about God's commission. Because if you're thinking, well, if God would call me to do something, I wouldn't do what Jonah did. But brothers and sisters, God has called us to do something. Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 28. Crystal clear. Go to the nations. Make disciples. Proclaim the Lordship of Christ. But many of us, including myself, find multiple excuses to not participate in that on a daily basis, right? If we're honest. And in the darkness of our hearts, sometimes it's because we kind of secretly don't want certain people to hear about it. Because what if God saves them? Because they're not very good people. We tend to think of it as an option, not a definitive calling. In some cases, we show ourselves to be resistant to making disciples, especially if it's going to require us to go to those people that we don't think are worthy of God's mercy. And we can, we can rail on Jonah all we want, but the reality is many of us are very similar to Jonah. We feel like it's our job to decide who gets to hear the gospel and who's worthy of hearing the gospel. And then it's our terms on which we're going to deliver that. But if God's people won't be accountable to God and humble ourselves, God will humble us publicly. That's what he's doing to Jonah. He's like, if you're not going to get on board with this, I'm, I'm going to make a spectacle of you. I'm going to show my power even when you're disobedient. I mean, it's a great thing about God. When he loves us, like he's not just going to give up on us. Because he loves us, he's like, this is going to be embarrassing for you, but it's going to be good for you in the long run. God is not unaware of the evil in the world. You think God didn't know about the Assyrians? Of course he knew about the Assyrians. Just like he knew about the Babylonians. Just like he knew about the Hittites. He's not unaware of the evil of the world. Right now at this moment, I know a lot of us are like, man, the world seems more evil than it's ever been. God is fully aware of how evil the world is right now. Do you know that? He is not out of control. Everything that's happening in the world right now, if God wanted to change it, he would. Do you hear me? God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. That's, that's comforting to us. God sees the evil. He knows it. He's going to deal with it. In fact, we'll look a little bit later of how he has dealt with it. He's not aware, and he's not too weak to deal with it. He was aware of Assyria, he was aware of Jonah, and he is acutely aware of these pagan sailors. And in his grace and mercy, he is going to ensure that after today, these sailors are without excuse. At this point in the story, we might be thinking, well, is it fair, though, for these sailors to get caught up in the consequences of Jonah's sin? This is where we have to sort of expand our understanding of God's sovereignty in the human condition, okay? I want you to, to, to go here with me. The, the second thing that we see pop up in here is that all people must acknowledge their guilt before God, okay? God sees the evil of, of every person. He's not oblivious, okay? 
But, but because God sees that, everybody at some point is going to have to acknowledge their own guilt before God, either willingly or under compulsion, right? Because it'll come, we'll come face to face with our guilt. We'll see that about Jonah and about the sailors. What happens next really exposes the blindness people have of their own sin and depravity. Because you might be like, what did these sailors ever do to get roped in with this Yehu who's trying to run away from God? Doesn't seem fair. But look what they said to one another. Verse 7. They said to one another, come let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Okay, two problems with this. First one is this, theologically. They see the storm as evil when it's actually a sign of God's love and mercy, not just for Jonah, but for Nineveh as well, right? So what the sailors are like, hey, this evil is happening. It seems to be evil because it's bad for them, but we look at it from the eyes of of Scripture, and we know that what God's actually trying to do is make sure that the message of his mercy goes to this great city, Nineveh, in which many people will hear about his mercy, right? But they can only see it from their narrow view. They see it as evil. It's also a commentary on how they viewed gods in general, that gods are not benevolent and kind and merciful, that they were used to these gods who were capricious and nasty and mean and hateful and evil, and they only did stuff to mess with people. So they're like, okay, who did something? This is only, this this is an evil thing that this God has sent. So who did something wrong? Who made the God mad? Okay, so the, the first problem is seeing that as evil. But I also want to bring this up. None of them seems to recognize the depth of their own sins. So hang with me here for a second. Who's on the boat? Ancient sailors, right? Ancient sailors. So they all come to the understanding that this must be a God who's mad at something that they did wrong. Ancient sailors. And not one ancient sailor assumes that they've done anything bad enough to warrant the anger of a God. Let me say that again. Not one ancient sailor thinks they've done anything bad enough to court the anger of a god. Have you ever heard the phrase, they talk like a sailor? Does anybody ever heard the stories of sailors in ports, ancient? Has anybody seen Pirates of the Caribbean? And all these guys are like, it ain't me. Is it him? Is it him? What did you do? What did you do? Do, do you find that funny? Like, not one of these ancient sailors thinks that they've, they've done anything worth punishing, which is hilarious because they're ancient sailors. Those guys, you spend a week with those dudes, I guarantee there's some shadiness going on, right? I know one guy was like, I was in port with this dude. I guarantee it's because of him, right? Not one of them was like, yeah, this is because. If I was on that boat, not even being a sailor, I would have been like, this is probably me, right? This is probably something that I did. They can't figure it out. You see how bad sin really is, though? Even these guys who know, they, they don't know. They assume that it can't be because of them. N- none of these men thought their sins were worthy of a, a greater punishment. Maybe, perhaps the greatest evil is that we don't think it would be justified for God to judge us with severity. And instead, we point the finger at other people so that we might seem innocent by comparison. They're all like, who is it, you? Is it you? Because it, it can't be me. I know me, Right? These sailors are having a hard time figuring it out. So they almost have to, they pretty much have to roll dice to agree on who it is. And the reality is most people will agree with you that they're a sinner, but very few will admit that even the smallest sin in their sight is worthy of the most severe punishment. In fact, of separation from the very God who created them. It's not hard to get somebody to admit that they're a sinner. It is very hard to get somebody to admit that even the smallest sin has courted the righteous justice of the God who created them. That's the hard part. Right? They didn't think any of their sins would have warded punishment, so they cast lots. If you don't know what casting lots was, it basically is kind of rolling these dice, so to speak, and as they landed, they'd sort of determine what the gods or what God wanted. Now, in some cases, this is warranted, and there's, there's a, we're not going to go into the huge discussion on this, but in some cases in Scripture, it's warranted. Like when Judas needs to be replaced after hanging himself and they choose Matthias, that's how they did it. They cast lots. If you look in Israel's history in the Old Testament, there are some times where they cast lots. 
lots, but they would only cast lots rightly when they were trying to determine specifically something that God was calling them to engage in. Not just like, I get up in the morning, I'm like, hey, do I want Chick-fil-A or do I want Hardee's? Right? That's not, not capriciously. These sailors were like, just roll, you know, roll dice for everything, cast lots for everything. We got to figure out who this is going to fall on. But again, because of God's sovereignty, it fell right where it should fall. The lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, look at verses 8 and 9, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? Now they want to get real personal with this guy. Well, if it's because of you, what did you do? Like, why? You must have done something super bad. And Jonah said, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. These men had not yet acknowledged their own guilt, but God was going to expose Jonah's guilt before them. So Jonah tells them his whole story, and they are incredulous that Jonah would run from the God who made the sea and the dry land. So again, these pagan guys, they were like territorial gods. This God's in charge of that. This, Jonah's like, I, I'm a Hebrew, right? I fear the Lord who made the dry land and the sea. And they're like, dude, you're running on a boat from the God who made the sea? What a stupid oversight, right? Like, how dumb do you have to be to run from the God who made the sea on the sea? Like, even they're like, this is ridiculous. Why would you do that? What is this that you have done? Why would you do this? And again, the prophet of God is being rebuked by pagans for running from his God-ordained mission. God was delivering a rebuke from people who don't know God. And we shouldn't be surprised to be rebuked by unbelievers if we won't live in obedience to God. If Jonah won't acknowledge his own guilt and return to the Lord, he'd be forced to acknowledge his guilt before everyone. Why? Because God loves Jonah. That's a hard truth, too. Yeah, Jonah's wrong. But one of the things that we see in this book is God's relentless pursuit of his, of his prophet. He's like, I'm not going to let you not do this. You're going to do this. The Lord disciplines those he loves. One of the most amazing things about this book is God's love and care for a prophet who repeatedly begrudges his calling. God deals with Jonah's evil because it is the best thing for Jonah. If you find yourself running for, from God and your life starts getting hard, it's not because God's mad at you. It's because God loves you. If you start running from God and there is no resistance, that's when you should be afraid. Do you understand? Scripture is very clear. The Lord disciplines those he loves. So if you're just running with, with no problems at all, not tripping over anything, God's not making you look like a fool in front of other people who don't know God, that's when you need to be a little bit upset, right? God is doing to Jonah exactly what he does for his people. And the third point we see in this is that God knows the evil, and every person is going to be responsible for their own guilt, but God has a plan to deal with both the evil and the guilt of all people. So the sailors immediately jump into action. They need to know how to deal with the judgment of Jonah's God, and they're asking him, what are we supposed to do, right? What do we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? Look at verse 11. What, what are we supposed to do? The sea is growing worse and worse, more and more tempestuous. What are we supposed to do? Okay, you're the one who got us into this mess. You tell us how we're supposed to get out. So now, now they're, they're in with it. They're like, okay, well, your God is clearly the one who's in charge here. You got to tell us how to deal with your God. And Jonah says to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, for I know it's because of me that this tempest has come upon you. What is Jonah's big plan? Throw me overboard. Throw me overboard. Now, even the sailors think this is a little too extreme, right? They're like, uh, no. Nevertheless, verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So everything they're trying, it's getting harder and harder and harder and harder. They redoubled their efforts, right? Even these idol-worshiping sailors didn't want to consider Jonah uh, to, to kill Jonah in order to survive. This is basically like a human sacrifice. Jonah's like, throw me overboard, right? And then it, it'll all stop. And the sailors are like, we don't want to do this, right? So now you have these idol-worshiping sailors who are showing more compassion to Jonah than Jonah was showing to the, the idol-worshiping sailors or to Nineveh. You see how Jonah is being rebuked here? 
But no matter what they would try, there was no other way. All their effort wasn't going to accomplish the salvation of this boat. God was not going to relent, and they weren't going to be able to save Jonah or themselves just by trying harder, no matter how noble their intentions might have been. These sailors cared more about Jonah than Jonah cared about Nineveh. And this is also, remember I said earlier, the human condition is, is complicated as well because it's not like the evil of people means that all people are only continually evil because you know that would be a terrible place. That's the reason of the flood was like every inclination of man's heart was only evil continually. We know that it's not like that right now. There's evil, but it's not as bad as it could be. And even these pagan sailors show concern for Jonah. Right? And this is kind of this crisis of like people who don't know God and, and are living in their, their evil of denying him and yet still are kind to people and still experience the goodness of God, right? It's another really great insight. These sailors who can't see the depth of their own sin in light of God's holiness exhibit a flicker of God's character and the kindness that they show to Jonah. They don't want to sacrifice him. They want to make sure he makes it, okay? But no amount of goodness can save them. Which brings us to this point. We cannot be saved by our own efforts, no matter how noble they might be, and we certainly can't be saved by other people's efforts. What is God trying to show us in the story about those sailors rowing hard for shore? You can't save yourself. When God's judgment is upon you, you can't save yourself. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Verses 14 and 15. Therefore they called out to the Lord, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. They beg for God's mercy for what they're about to do. They finally throw him overboard and it stops just like that. And here is another deep truth delivered to humanity. We all know that the price for shunning the God who made the sea and the dry land is death. The only appropriate price or cost for rejecting God is death. And now that these sailors have seen God's action, they're without excuse, right? God provided a means of deliverance for the sailors, and we are told that they feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. That's the, the last verse right there, verse 16. The men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice and made vows. Now, we're not told ultimately what became of these sailors. Maybe some really did turn to God, right? Maybe for some of them, the, the taking vows, they were just adding this God on to their growing pantheon of gods or their growing idols in their house. Uh, we're not told specifically how many of these guys really served the Lord from this point. We, we're not told. It's quite likely maybe a number of them just added him to the list of gods that they already gave tribute to. But maybe some did truly worship him, right? Right? Some did maybe truly repent of their idol worship and worship the Lord. But one thing is absolutely true of all these sailors on this day because of God's action. They were now without excuse. They now had no excuse to say that this God doesn't exist or that he doesn't work miracles. They had no excuse to reject the reality of the one true God. When you see God's action in dealing with sin and rebellion, you are now without an excuse. God set aside Jonah to deliver a message of his mercy and a warning of destruction to those whose evil had come up before him. But God sent his son to deliver a message of his mercy and a warning of destruction to those whose evil had come up before him. You can't deal with guilt by minimizing your sin. That's how we approach it now. Like, get rid of the guilt by minimize the, minimizing our sin. You can't deal with guilt by trying to outweigh your own ignorance, by good deeds or kindness to others. Jonah was going overboard because that was the only way God was going to deal with the problem. That's the only way. There's no other way. The harder they tried, the worse it got. And while Jonah is not exactly a Christ figure, we certainly see echoes of the gospel in this first chapter. The cross was the declaration that all men are without excuse. It wasn't just a display for a few sailors on a ship. The cross was the declaration that everyone for all time is without excuse. The Son of Man was lifted up. Peter declared in Acts 2.36 that Jesus was Lord and Christ. There's salvation in no other name. John chapter 3 
Jesus, in talking to Nicodemus, says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. No one is without excuse. God has acted definitively in history through His Son, Jesus Christ. No one is without excuse. Jonah later will admit he didn't want to deliver the message because he knew God was merciful. How do you like that? God's like, I don't, uh, Jonah's like, God, I don't want to tell them because I know that you have great mercy for them. So God lovingly disciplined Jonah so that the message would be delivered to everyone he came in contact with. And even in how God would deal with Jonah, he would leave the people around Jonah with absolutely no excuse that he is God and he is the one who works salvation alone. Right? You see that? But Jesus made this clear in, in Luke eleven thirty two. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The world is without excuse, right? And as, as hesitant as we are, believers, as hesitant as we are at times to proclaim the message of God's mercy, God is going to make sure that the world gets this message. Do you believe that? God's, God is relentless. He's not like, okay, if you guys don't want to do it, it's okay. He will pursue you until you will pursue delivering that message of mercy to others. If you belong to him and you are, you are, you're like, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be this person. God will chase you down no matter how far you run, and he will let you know that you are going to be an example to other people. He will work his discipline in your life. He will call you to deliver that message. He will relentlessly pursue you because he loves you. Amen? Because he loves you. And he will relentlessly pursue you to share the gospel with the world because he loves people. Amen? So by way of application this morning, believer, there's a couple things for us. First, take your own sin seriously. Don't minimize your guilt. Look, as believers, I know we, we think, hey, we shouldn't feel guilty. Look, it was right for Jonah to feel guilty about running. It's right for us to feel guilty when we disobey the Lord. But the good news is that God immediately tells us we don't have to carry that guilt because he's already dealt with it in Christ. Amen? Amen. So we feel guilty, but we immediately realize that we don't have to pay for that sin. But we take it seriously. We don't try to minimize it. We realize that sin is a big deal in our lives. Sin is evil in our lives, but we just know the one who's dealt with it. So taking our own sin seriously means taking his grace seriously. Own it, repent it, and honor Christ in living for him. And the other thing is this. Joyfully proclaim God's mercy to, in Christ to those who are slaves to sin. We shouldn't be callous to the coming judgment for those without Christ. We should be passionate about proclaiming the mercy to others we have received and trust the Lord to accomplish the results. I said this in the first service. I'll say it again. I, I know of myself right now in this cultural moment. There are so, so many of us are more angry and, and mad at people who are sinners and evil. Look, there are people doing evil deeds in this world. I understand, right? But listen, they in the flesh, are not our enemies. Do you understand what I'm saying? For those of us who have heard the gospel, God sent Jonah to a wicked nation to proclaim his mercy. If we as believers cannot find it to share with the most evil person the greatness of the grace of God, then we maybe don't understand it. We're no different than Jonah. I'm not going to give that message to those people because maybe they'll get saved. But I want you to consider what an evil thing that is to say. You are not the arbiter of salvation, and I am not. 
God is and when he calls us to go proclaim to the world his grace and mercy in Jesus Christ, we do it because we've experienced it. Yes? If we were more concerned about people coming to know the Lord than we are about our own opinions or our own judgment of whether or not other people are worthy, we would be more excited about sharing the gospel. And that's me included. Stop running from the commission to make disciples. And for those of you who are in here who have not trusted in Christ this morning, I want you to know that you are without excuse. You've heard the gospel. Christ died according to the Scriptures for our sin. The wrath of God was on Christ on the cross. The death that we should die, Christ died on our behalf. He was buried, raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, breaking the power of sin and death. There is salvation in no other name but Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the Gospel. You're without excuse. You can never say, I didn't know. I haven't heard. If you're in here this morning, you've never trusted in Christ. The call this morning is to repent and believe the gospel. No amount of your effort will save you. Only what Christ has accomplished on your behalf. The only thing that stands between you and eternal destruction is what Christ has done. And we would beg and plead with you to bow the knee, to humble yourself. And as these sailors did, (laughs) call out for mercy to the only God who saves Brothers and sisters, this morning, we serve a great and merciful God. Let's not, let's not follow the path of Jonah to run from his call, to run from that commission. Let's gladly accept that dangerous calling of walking into a world without knowledge of God and proclaiming the truth that God is merciful and he saves and there is hope and life in Christ in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, I pray that you would help us to really think about um, the depth of your mercy towards us, Lord, that if it were not for your great grace, we would all be dead in our sins and trespasses. Lord, help us to understand that salvation belongs to you. You're the one who gets to, to make the call on how that call should go out. Father, you have proclaimed to us, you have commissioned us to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that you've commanded. Lord, our call is clear. I pray that you would help us to learn from this book, Lord, your truth, your word, not to run from what you've commissioned us to do, Lord, but to joyfully go into it knowing, Father, that you are the one who owns salvation. It belongs to you, and it has come to us through your grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? We're going to sing the doxology as we go this morning. <clears throat> so some of you may not be familiar, but we're going to try it together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning as we go, again, Matthew chapter 28, as we're sent this morning, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is our commission. Let's go willingly, willingly, with joy and with mercy, sharing this message with the world. Amen? Let's encourage each other as we go. You're free to go this morning.